Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your perspective on the world, and welcome to Trading Coaches Playbook. Uh, you can see I'm a little bit casual today, getting ready to watch my fighting fills in the World Series. Got my shirt here. There you go, my old school and my hat. So uh, anyway, I'm a little excited for that to start off. We'll see what happens uh, this season. It's been a kind of crazy, but uh, getting to the markets... Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, getting to the markets here, uh, just need to remind everybody, we're not broker dealers or investor advisors. We're Phillies fans, but um, we are not telling you to buy or hold anything in particular or personalizing this towards any particular individual. When you mentioned security is not a recommendation. Oh, let me turn that off. And we are not registered broker dealers, and therefore we're not registered, or sorry, not uh, subject to trading restrictions. We could have a position of security and initiate one at any time. Stay in touch with us. We do a lot of workshops. Obviously, uh, we got the Trading Coaches Playbook here every Friday. Looks like we got some new stuff coming up. How to not how not to get your you know what kicked coming up in uh, November. So check that out when that comes out. I'm not sure who's doing those. If that's Rob or somebody else, that's kind of interesting. I'll check it out myself. And we got Power Hour free every Monday as well. Also, you can stay in touch with us online. Uh, my Twitter's not out there, but you can always hang out uh, at Trader B Dub, and that's my Twitter. And Oh, thanks, Miguel. And uh, it was great meeting you, by the way. <laughs> Finally got to meet everybody. I don't, I don't get to meet everybody because everything's always done remotely. And it was kind of neat to be able to put faces to the names and get to meet some people. I was up in uh, New York yesterday. So Long Island got to do a little workshop there and got to meet Miguel and a bunch of other people. So it was a lot of fun. Anyway, for this workshop today, uh, what we're going to do is take a look at the overall market and kind of get an idea of what the heck is happening. So actually, before I forget, I wanted to check on something here, bring up a new chart, because I was supposed to get access to stock charting now live as well, which I don't know if I do have yet. Doesn't look like it. Oh, wait, that's, yeah, it's all symbols. So I might have to redo something here and fix it, but oh, well, that's fine. I've got other platforms to use, so it's no big deal. I always have backups and plans. And I got my trading platforms open. So let me see, there's where I want to go. Anyway, so yeah, I was doing this on a day in the life of the online trader yesterday, live in New York, had a lot of fun with that. And if you didn't catch me there, too bad, but I'll do it again, possibly sometime soon in the near future, somewhere in the world. And you might be able to catch it. But um, anyway, <laughs> I just got a question asked, uh, how about if the Phillies win the World Series, I offer my SPX spreads options group for 50% off, maybe not 50%, but I'll do some sort of a discount to celebrate. How's that? I got to figure out what that'll end up being. If you're not familiar, I do this thing called SPX cash flow secrets, which pretty much every day I put out a trade idea. And uh, they've been doing really, really well. Basically, I teach people how to do this. You can see in the SPX cash flow secrets section, there are educational videos here that teach you how to do the type of trades that I'm doing. I'm basically doing a day trade on the S&P index every day. So for instance, I go out, I was looking at crude oil earlier, but SPX. And yesterday's trade, for instance, was here. What I did was in the afternoon, right around two o'clock, I think it was. Yeah. So what I did was I identify where prices are not likely to go. And you can see my alerts were sitting there as well. I can remove that alert because I don't need that anymore. There we go. But basically, if prices are not going to go somewhere, we can sell options on that. And we collect premium at the end of the day. We actually had three trades, I believe, put in. I can actually check to see what the last text messages were. There it is. So I put in the text message. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they were right through here. It doesn't put out the whole thing, but most of it is there. You can see, let's see. This was the first one, I think. 3795, 3800 for the Iron Condor. I was talking about the zones. Oh, no, that's not it. That was not yesterday. This is the one. The aggressive iron condor, the alternative, more um, conservative iron condor. And then that was it. There was actually another one, a third trade I thought that I put out as well. I'm not seeing it there. But anyway, uh, we put out those trades and it expired worthless. Basically, you got to trust the zone because by the end of the day, it came close to the zone, but never broke it. And if you stayed with those opportunities, you ended up profiting. So if I take a look real quick. I'm on the wrong side there, but I can get that open. Let's see. I just have to add in the new trades. are not on my tracking sheet yet, but for this month, we're doing pretty well. Basically, as I said, it's a minimum of one trade per day if the market is you know, conducive to that. 
And you can see we do either bull put spreads, bear call spreads, or iron condors. And there's all the explanations on how to do those trades in the uh, self-paced education online there. And most of the trades, as you can see, are being put in late in the day. If we don't want a lot of risk, you know, here's an hour to 45 minutes worth of risk to collect 13% rate of return. So the rate of return has been pretty darn good. You can see that if, by the way, you only need $500 per contract in order to put on this trade. So it's not like it's really prohibitive where you got to have tens of thousands of dollars to do this. You know, you want to have a cushion. So I wouldn't just do this trading with only 500 bucks, but you can see with the $2,000 account, you would have following these trades, we had 91% win rate for the month, only two losers so far. And we have a pretty good rate of return on that money. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit about the SPX cash flow secrets. So getting to the markets, I'm sure everybody's kind of wondering what the heck is going on with the broad markets right now? What can we do about it? So let's see something here. Yeah, we can take a look. First of all, I want to see which market is leading us. And if I go, I'm on the SPX, I might as well look at weekly time frame here. There we go. And obviously, we've had this big drop down. I was talking to people. That's my Twitter handle, by the way, if you want, at Trader B Dub. You can catch me on Twitter. And what I'm going to do is remove that for now. Actually, I could just leave it. It doesn't matter. But you can see we started this decline pretty much the week of August 15th. And we've been rallying off the lows from the October 10th lows right there, doing a bit of a correction. So this is on the SPX. I actually prefer to track the futures. And looking at the futures, let me clean this chart up. You know, because they're trading 24 hours, they react to more things. Really what we want to focus on is what's going on in this little hook back to the upside because we are in a retracement of our downward impulse and we've already retraced 38%. And we're heading towards that 50% retracement potentially. Uh, what happened was we are still in a bear trend overall, okay? And I'm, I'm going to see which one's the leader, by the way. I haven't forgotten about that. Um, but right here, we can see that we've had a, almost a 50% retracement. We're still in a bearish trend because we can't get any rallies yet above 60. As long as the RSI on the weekly chart stays below 60, we are in a very bearish market. Now, we had what's called a positive divergence. Prices were moving down, but we made new lows with less momentum to the downside. And that's what led to this move back up. But typically when you start moves upwards and the RSI is below 40, when you start that move, you do not make new highs. You know, there are exceptions, but typically you don't make new highs, at least without a pullback. Even here, there's an example of that. We have a low being made right here and we're below 40, obviously in the RSI. And you can see that there's the recent high. Now you're probably saying, wait a minute, Brandon, it went over that. No, 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 wait. It tried to go up. It stalled right here, made a new low. Notice there's a low right here with higher low and higher high on either side. So that's an actual low. And the RSI is not below 40. So that was the indication that now it had enough momentum to break out above that prior high. But we never went into bullish territory. As you can see, couldn't get above 60. So we were still bearish, and therefore the next move down was easily able to make a new low, although it did retrace slightly here for that high, but both highs were below 60, and we went down. Now, the reason why I bring this up is we are moving up right now. Our most recent high is pretty much this, right? Right here, 78.6% retracement. And there's almost, I can't say almost no way, but I mean, it's a very slim possibility that we'd be able to break that high without some sort of retracement first, because our origin of our move was from below 40 on the RSI. We had too much bearish momentum to make new highs without a pullback. So I don't think we're out of the bearish trend, and I think that we're going to turn around somewhere here. So we go down to the daily time frame to get a little more detail. And we are stalling out right now. We're at a critical test point for the S&P, and here's why. This is an area of supply. We have rally, base, drop, and you can see we come into this area and could not get above 60 again. You know, that's kind of the key point. If we can't make that momentum, to get above 60, we stay in the bearish trend. Here we are again today showing bullish activity, but 
will we, number one, be able to break that previous high? Number two, get above 60 on the RSI or even get above the previous high? That's why you got short, Nick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there may be some shorting opportunities. If it cannot get above that, then we're going to roll over and start dropping pretty quick. Oh, you started doing that because of this move initially in the follow through here. Yeah, I get it. And then you got crushed as it rally back up. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, still fighting to go back up. And I saw that on the smaller time frames. That's what I was going to show you as well. But on the higher time frame, the key thing is see what happens if we can get to 3,900. And when or if we get to 3,900, if the RSI is below 60, we're going to turn back down. If we get to 3,900, we're above 60, we're going to keep going. And I'll start to wonder if maybe we put in the bottom of the market, but I just don't see it as happening. That's actually not a good zone. I'm not even going to mark that. I was thinking there might have been drop based drop, and there's not there. So, oh, thank you, Rolando. Yeah, Rolando was in the New York um, workshop that I did, and I gave a, an explanation of how I use that RSI in more detail there. So that was kind of fun. Glad I did that. And he said it was the bomb. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let me go before I go to the smaller time frame. Again, we were talking about the highs and lows. The low right here, October 13th, the high was um, actually back in August right here on the 16th. So what I'm going to do is take a look to see if we're going to bottom out, we need to know which market is going to lead us. And unfortunately, whoops, what's going on there? Do the wrong one, that one. Uh, we need to see which market is leading us in which direction. So unfortunately, I changed my charts because I was doing some other teaching here, but it doesn't take long for me to build this chart back up. I want all four equity indexes on one chart. And the reason why is now I'll be able to plot them against each other to see which one is likely to move and lead us in which direction. So let's go with that magenta color, a little bit thicker for the NASDAQ. You can see they got the labels on the right-hand side, which is awesome. And we'll go with green or teal for the Russell. There we go. And the Dow, I usually do it in black. All right, there we go. So now we're all set up on a percent change chart. And again, I can go back to, well, that August 16th high and the leader to the downside was the NASDAQ. So what happens is you basically follow the leader. The leading market will typically tell you what everything else is going to reverse. So when the NASDAQ starts to find demand or starts to show bullish pressure, higher lows, higher highs, you notice that the strong market, the Dow, was actually able to jump quite a bit. So well, let's see, maybe the Dow is our leader to the upside now. Well, the NASDAQ doesn't like to be left behind, so it tried to take over. But yeah, it looks like the Dow is still leading us upwards. Let me zoom in a little more so we can see this better. There we go. Starting wall well from that October low, you can see the Dow is still our leader to the upside. So we will focus on the Dow to let us know when and if we're likely to turn down because that's kind of like a helium-filled balloon and the other are lead weights being dragged upwards by that balloon. So if the balloon pops, you know what's going to happen with the weights. So going back, let's take a look at that Dow. And I can start off on the big picture. I keep doing that wrong button. Just use this little account to do some charting here. There we go. <laughs> I keep doing wrong buttons. All right. So again, weekly. YMZ 2022, there we are. And you can see how much more bullish the Dow is, right? As a matter of fact, let's do continuous contract. That's a little bit better, there we go. And on this continuous contract, you can see the Dow is up above that little basing area that we saw that was holding the NAS or sorry, the S&P down. And we've got a much deeper retracement of our most recent impulse. I think we're already at 78.6%, it looks like. Almost there. And really, the only supply we have is the top of the previous move. So the Dow is in much better shape than the other markets. We might even get more momentum than we had on the previous peak. Or this could be just a capitulation of all the bulls trying to jump in and propel prices higher before we end. You know, one of the things that happens often, let me put in that indicator of volume. You can see that the novices tend to chase. And actually, this is not showing it. 
believe it or not, this week is not spiking in volume. Usually when you get capitulation, you get stuff like this. You know, look at this red candle right there. Let me do it like this. There we go. You can see the volume underneath. Notice when you start getting a big move as a breakout, you get a spike in volume. A lot of times from a lot of the novices jumping in late, and that usually leads to a change in the trend. Sometimes it's just a correction like this one was. Sometimes it's an actual reversal. So what I just noticed on this chart was that's kind of a large candle. We didn't quite break out of the prior high yet, did we? Let's see, 789, 747, not quite. We're close. So we're close to the prior high there. Dow Jones went above the 200 today. Okay. Yeah, so we're seeing a push back up, but you got to wonder, you know, who's driving that market? Is it really the institutions? We won't know until technically three o'clock today. And the reason why I say we really won't know until three o'clock today is there's a report that comes out and it's every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And unfortunately, it's delayed data. It's, it's Tuesday's data. Talk about a great government job, right? This person's got to collect all the data on Tuesday and they have to till Friday to put out the data. <laughs> it's all done electronically. They can put it out immediately if they wanted to. Anyway, it's under cftc.gov. And it's called the Commitment of Traders Reports. So right here, if I go to econ uh, economic analysis, there's COT, Commitment of Traders. And unfortunately, this is just going to be the raw data. So I can still look at it if I want to. We can go look at the CME or the CBOT. Uh, CBOT that's where the Dow is traded. So I can actually look. Let's see, does it have Dow? Nope. DJIA, there it is. And you can see these are the uh, big traders, the reportable positions. We're the day traders, we're non-reportables. So right now, the traders, the big traders, non-commercial, are actually net short. It's kind of hard to see that. Let's see if I can zoom in a little more. So this was, again, from last week. This is showing the 18th. Okay, so if you take a look at the date, the 18th was last Tuesday. This report came out on the 21st. So it's a little bit delayed, but it's better than nothing. And what you want to see, especially when the report comes out today, is what is the change in those non-commercial big traders? What is the change in their trading? Okay. Uh, yeah, this will be recorded. Absolutely. Yeah, this will be recorded. This will be on, available on our YouTube channel later if you're not able to catch the whole thing. So you'll catch it. Just go to the uh, Wealth Builders HQ uh, YouTube page and you'll see this video later. Anyway, you can see right here, you've got the uh, change from the previous week was much more short, right? And they close out more longs. And it's weird here on the non-commercial, non-reportable, these are traders like us, they got out of both longs and shorts, and they're still net short. So what you really look for sometimes is if they're changing their position, if you notice this week that there are a lot more longs and less shorts coming in, then you gotta tell, you'll know that the pros are starting to shift their position, trying to figure out the bottom. But overall, you know, we're still two to one on the short side for those commercials, just on the Dow alone. We can look at the other indexes as well. If you don't like the format of this, which is just the raw data, it's the easiest thing to look at, but you can also get this for free at barchart.com. And under futures, You've got, where is it? There it is, Commitment to Traders right at the top. Uh, my favorite chart service, I actually love TradingView, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want, I can give you my referral code too. <laughs> Shameless self-plug, right? Uh, where'd it go? There it is. Uh, referred friends. If you're interested, you don't have to, but right there, that'll get you $30 free. Try it out if you're interested. Anyway, I mean, I pay for it regardless, but yeah, I like TradingView because I get a lot of good trading things there, but I also, you have to feed the data with something. So I have my live account, one of my accounts from, uh, ah, where is it? Amp Futures that feeds this. You can link it to a bunch of different brokers anyway. So where was I? Commitment to Traders Report right here. When we go back to barchart.com again, it was under Futures and commitment of traders in the section in the middle there, you'll see that we can actually look at this whole report as a chart and you can look at any futures contract for it. So let's go to the NASDAQ. And on the NASDAQ, okay, 
This is the, what is this? Go to COT chart. Uh, it's more of an interactive chart, I believe. Yeah, I like the last one better because it actually had the legends. I don't need the interactive for this moment. So again, I'll go back. And you can see, oh no, it doesn't have a legend there. There it is. You can see we're looking for the non-commercials, large speculators, managed money. Basically, it's the big brokers. And what they've been doing, you can see it's a little delayed, but they were exiting their longs and they see the market really just follows kind of what they do. So if they start exiting their shorts and this starts going up, the problem is you can't really see the latest data because it's going to be delayed on the chart as well. So you can just get the overall trend. And the overall trend is the professionals were trying to go short, expecting the markets to continue to go down. And you can do that, like I said, for any security that's traded in the futures. We can go to crude oil, get an idea of what's happening there. And you can see that they actually bottomed out uh, they closed out a bunch of longs because the market was dropping, but now we're getting an increase in the professional longs and we're getting an increase in the uh, non-professionals, the small traders, I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Blue is the small traders. I was saying that, the, that these are the commercials, the hedgers. They're increasing their shorts because they're going net long, but the professionals are starting to go long on crude oil. That, ex that means they're expecting prices to bottom out here and possibly rise. So that's what that commitment of traders can tell you. And you can look at the raw data. As I said, I used to chart this myself. <clears throat> I would take all this info that we're getting here. And, you know, for instance, here, CME. And I would introduce that into Microsoft Excel and build my own charts. So you got all these different securities here, live cattle, lumber, uh, currencies, Canadian dollar. You got the equity markets. And if I was looking again for, where is it? Crude oil is NYMEX. There it is. Let's see. I'll do a search for crude. There it is. West Texas Internet uh, Intermediate Financial Crude Oil. And we can see what are the pros doing? Well, the week before, again, this is still over a week and a half delayed. So at three o'clock today, when the new number comes out, if you see they're continuing to increase their longs, then they're thinking that the market might be at a bottom. And you take a look at this. Non-commercial professional traders are net long almost three to one, right? But look what the small traders like us are doing. Who, which side do you want to be on? Okay. The normal small traders are going net short while the professionals are going net long. Uh, I think you might want to go with the pros, right? <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. So that's how the report can help and give you kind of an idea of what everybody's thinking. But unfortunately, it is a little bit delayed. So it's not the best thing, but it is something when we're trying to look at the bigger trends that are going on in the markets, okay? So getting back to the Dow, I'm gonna delete that indicator because I don't need it, but you can see the Dow is very, very bullish. It hasn't made a new high yet, okay? And I can introduce the moving average too. I know a lot of people are following that 200-day moving average. Let's see, moving average, there we go. I can put in two. Actually, I only probably need one, but on a simple moving average, a lot of people follow that 200 day moving average. I'm not on the daily chart, I'm on the weekly. So I'll look at the 13 week, actually no, that's the monthly one. Never mind. Let's put in 200 and change it over in a moment. There we go. Okay, and I don't need to see the other one. So anyway, that's what's going on in the weekly. We're testing the prior high and we are pretty close to where we were back here in the RSI as well. So this is showing that we may have enough momentum to maintain this move higher. The first level of supply that we're going to come to is here. And that's not until 33,485. So going down to the daily chart, you can see we are testing, as was mentioned. Uh, let's see, who was it? I want to give credit. Bradford mentioned that the Dow Jones went above the 200-day moving average. And it is, it is actually heading above that 200 day moving average right now as we're trying to beat the prior high. I'm sure that's watching, everybody's watching that right now with bated breath. It's at 789, the high so far today, 757, not quite there, but we're close. The question is, will we close above this average or will we suck back down below it? If we close above, it'd be interesting to see what happens next week. You know, next week, everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens with the Fed, right? If we go out to... And we have non-farm payroll coming out not too long from now. Let's see, going to next week for news. 
There we go. The fourth is, I believe, non-farm payroll. Where is it? Wednesday. There it is. So Wednesday is the FOMC, and it looks like they're expecting a three-quarter or 75 basis point move to the upside on those rates. And they're doing it on Japanese holiday. <laughs> Culture day. That's interesting. Don't know what that is. But anyway, that's what everybody's waiting for next week. And that'll obviously put a lot of pressure. Uh, if we end up closing above the 200, see a lot of rallying going on in the stock market. You'll wonder if that figures in at all to Jerome Powell's thinking. It shouldn't, to be honest with you. It should be in, in, you know, independent of that. But who knows? We'll just have to wait and see until on next week. And like I said, the fourth is also a big day because that's non-farm payroll right there. So a lot of news coming out next week could be a little quiet on Monday and Tuesday until then. But like I said, if I'm trying to figure out the markets turning around, the weekly chart and even the daily chart now on the Dow are saying, no, not yet. You can see we broke or not broke. We came to the prior high. We have enough momentum here on the daily chart to stay above this and actually do make a new high. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, will it stay above there? Just wait to see. You know, we'll probably get a retracement after we close that high if we can. Uh, it definitely didn't want to stay there. You see the candles leading up to today. We had topping tails where we sold off towards the end of the day. So it's very precarious. We could do the same thing. And if we keep doing that with topping tails and we get all that selling pressure up above, I wouldn't be surprised to see us collapse. But you have to wait. It's just not there yet. This hasn't told us. There's no sign of weakness as of yet. Let's go to a smaller time frame and see if there's anything. Nope. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that 200-day moving average because it really means nothing to me after this. But you can see that all we did was break out of our small range. And really, the Fibonacci is not doing anything for us either. I want to keep the chart clean. That's just the prior high. And we've got enough momentum to get there and break it. We were higher than we were before. So this is not showing any signs of let up. Even down the 60-minute chart, same thing. Still looking extremely bullish, surprisingly. You know, are there any zones that we might be running into? Back to the prior high, and the answer is no there. And there's a small little 60-minute supply zone just in front of the daily, or I think that was weekly supply as well. But we're not there. So the Dow looks like it still wants to go up, and it's taking everything with it. You know, the NASDAQ, which was dragging its feet, kicking its screaming, so to speak, I go back there. Let's see how it looks. Again, I'll start with the bigger picture, work my way down. So on the weekly chart, you see we're in this nice downtrend. Actually, that's what I also want to check real quick on the Dow. Hmm. I was just noticing kind of a pattern going on. I don't know if it's, it's not really symmetrical though, so I don't I hesitate to call it out. But you can see, yeah, it's not really symmetrical because we have that pop up right there. It might've just been an overshoot, who knows? It would be interesting to see if this holds up. Nope, that didn't quite catch. This looks like kind of a broadening or a megaphone type of formation going on here. And yeah, not quite, it's a little bit ugly because of the overshot areas, but you can see how we're just going back and forth. I don't know if that'll be the next leg down coming up. Again, if we, you know, this happens where we do that same thing, we hit that supply zone and just collapse down. That could happen. You know, and if we're holding this symmetry, and which we really didn't, you can see we didn't hit the bottom on this side, so that's why we went up first. Yeah, I don't know. This is still looking bullish to me. It's kind of crazy. I don't, I don't see anything else about it other than it went up too fast, and usually that does pull back, pull back down when you do this parabolic type move. But when I looked at the Nasdaq, I did notice a downward channel, right? The first thing I noticed when I looked at that chart was well, it looks kind of like a channel to the downside. And I was wondering about the Dow doing the same thing. And it was pretty similar, it wasn't exact. There we go. And these aren't exact, but it's pretty close. You see that widening formation that's going on. So this is kind of interrupting, well, not as much. Honestly, it's also doing a smaller one here. So maybe that's what we're going to do another smaller little channel inside the larger one. Or maybe I'm just drawing too much. <laughs> anyway, yeah. 
I was kind of curious. So getting into the weekly chart here of the NASDAQ, uh, this is definitely weaker than the Dow. Remember, the Dow retrace almost is past 61.8%, actually, I think, going up towards 78.2, I think, or 78.4. Anyway, oh, 76, sorry, it was heading up to 76. Here, we've only retraced 38%. Look at that. We hit it on the dot and fell back on the weekly chart. So you can clearly see the weakness in this index versus the Dow. And the Dow is only leading because it's such a bigger number and so many people follow it. You know, if you ask most traders, what is the market? They're not going to quote you the Dow because the Dow is only 30 stocks. They might quote you the S&P that's 500 stocks. You know, it's a better representation of the broad market. Or even the NASDAQ, it's got 100 stocks on this, the NASDAQ 100. So the Dow is not really representative of the U.S. economy, but a lot of people will follow it as the market because it's the biggest number. And that's what gets the most attention, and especially in America. You know, we don't like uh, European football, you know, or world football. We call our American football football. But, uh, you know, nobody wants to watch 90 minutes for one nil score. In the U.S., you know, we want that uh, 48 to 36 score, something big. So that's why there's so much emphasis on the Dow versus the other indexes. But really, the Dow is kind of crap as an indicator. It's price weighted, and it's only 30 stocks. So it, you know whatever the highest price stock can really influence it over everything else. That's not fair. Anyway, I say that because the other indexes are much weaker than the Dow, and they're just being dragged up by their toes because they don't they don't really want to go up. Can we go down to the daily chart. And again, you can see we've hit this level twice now and still can't get anywhere near 60. And even on the rally we're getting right now on the daily chart, you saw the Dow was way above 60. We're not even close to the prior high, let alone 60. So the NASDAQ is much, much weaker as an index. That's why it was leading to the downside. And it hasn't even tested its supply up here yet. So I don't see the Dow taking us higher long term. I think this is a short term phenomenon. And I think that, you know, when the news comes out next week with Powell and even the job report, then we're probably going to see more sinking to the downside. Yeah, I can take a look at Bitcoin. Yeah, I can definitely take a look at Bitcoin. And uh, my weekly analysis, I can add it to that. Yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar on YouTube, I have a channel where I do, it's called the Wendell Effect. And if you search for it, I do a weekly analysis on a lot of different securities. So yeah, I mean, I take requests, absolutely. You know, the channel's for you guys. So yeah, you can always do a search for that if you like. You know, I mentioned the Wealth Builders channel. And I should be subscribed to it, but I can look. WealthBuildersHQ.com. By the way, that's where you'll see this video. You can go to that channel, subscribe. And under, well, you can probably even look at playlists. It's the easiest way to go. And you got my e-mini think tank, and there's the coach's corner. That's where it'll end up being this video today. And then my other videos, as I mentioned, you can go to Wendell Effect, and you'll find my stuff there. Of course, you can subscribe there as well, but I do a weekly video. And yes, I can add crypto back in again. There hasn't been much to talk about in crypto, but I'll get to that too. Don't worry. Anyway, so looking at the NASDAQ, it does look like we are still weak. We are dragging back up. It doesn't look like it really wants to go. You can see we're not making new highs today by, by any means. If I go to a four-hour chart. Now, we uh, with the four-hour chart, we started this move up from below 40. So even though we're about to break 60, we haven't quite done it yet. We're 1591. That's close. We are sitting at the origin of this previous decline, first of all. Let me get rid of the FIBs for now. So not really a great supply zone by any means. We spent too much time at that level, but it was the origin of previous selling pressure and we can't seem to quite get above 60. I think we will. But remember, because we started this low from below 40, we should not break this high without a retracement. We haven't had a retracement yet. Okay. Hang Seng. I can take a look at the Hang Seng too. Sure. Absolutely. Anyway, I haven't looked at that since I was on CNBC in a long time ago. I'd like to get back on there sometime. I'll talk to them. Maybe you guys email too. <laughs> anyway, so you got, again, um, no signs of letting up today, but there should be some sort of pullback, especially after a pretty parabolic move like that. You go down a 60 minute chart, see if there's any kind of a, a zone. And there's really not a zone here. 
that's the problem. We're not getting any kind of supply or even resistance, if you will, at that area to push us down. So it's just got to be when the momentum dies and it's not dying yet. So you can't fight the trend. You just got to go with it. I'm on the 60 minute chart. There's nothing there. And I showed you on the S&P, might as well check out the Russell as the last one. And that's also been pretty volatile. I like the Russell a little bit better for gauging what's going on in the U.S. economy. And the reason why is these are smaller cap stocks that are really only exposed to U.S. markets for the most part. They're not exposed as much to the um, international markets. Okay. Um, well, I don't place as much emphasis on the Fibonacci's. Oh, I'm looking at the major moves, not every single move when I withdraw my fib lines. Yeah, so I'm looking at the major impulse. So for instance, here, if I'm drawing this down, I would use this, not this, because that's the overall move. This was a pause in the overall move. So yeah, it's just a matter of what I'm looking at when I look at my trends. And another way of doing that too, when you're looking for trends, is just looking at a line chart. And now you can see that looks better for the overall trend right here, doesn't it? That doesn't look like it was the start of a trend. So yeah, there are times where I draw them a little bit differently, not exactly from the top and bottoms. And there's adjustments I do. I prefer this, honestly, than this. That is where I'm going to the very top of the wick. I actually prefer using the open of the candle that gave the move down, the start of the move. And I found that it could be a little more accurate uh, from time to time. So, but you know, a lot of people do this, so that may end up working better. And you can see it did. We actually hit from the high. Anyway, either way, we're still pulling back. Notice we've retraced over 50% of the last impulse. The NASDAQ only did 38.2%. So that's going to be the leader when we start going down again. That's going to be the mark you want to short for sure. What was the ES on the retracement? Let's see. There it is. Yeah, almost 50%. So the NASDAQ, which I took it off. There it is. Oh, no, that's only 38.2. Yeah, that's the weakest one. Everything else is near 50% retracement. Go back to the Russell. And the other ones, yeah, see how much stronger that is? So the NASDAQ is going to be the best short opportunity when it starts turning down. And it's getting beat up by earnings anyway. So going down to the daily time frame, again, no signs of weakness. We're above 60. Heck, these lows that were put in here were not below 40. So we had no problem breaking prior highs every time we rallied. And that means this high is in jeopardy of getting broken. So we're pushing through. There's nothing to hold us down anymore, to be honest with you. And this could keep going along with the Dow. As long as the Dow keeps going up, it doesn't run out of energy. So really, if we're trying to figure out the turning point for these markets, kind of really focus on the Dow. For some reason, these markets are following that Dow. And you can see that if I go back to even the daily chart, we retraced a lot of that previous move. Hmm. So until we start seeing weakness in the trend, you got to play the long side in those equity markets. You know, there's no sign of the trend ending yet because one, there's no supply overhead. You know, just that daily or weekly zone way up there. And I think this is a four hour zone, was it? Let me see. Nope, it was 60 minute zone. It wasn't even a four hour, 60 minute zone and then the daily, the weekly zone above it. So yeah, until this dies off. Now, what it could do, which would signal a reversal, would be make a small double top. And if it does that, you want to make sure that the momentum, the RSI basically makes a smaller high on the second high. Okay, so basically if I draw it out, and it could be happening on that four hour or even as low as the 60 minute time frame that you would see it. So you'd see price kind of pulling back a little bit, making another run higher. And it could even make a higher high, but it should make a lower high if it's really going to break down like this, slightly lower. And what should happen at the same time is that the RSI should be lower as well. And that will give you the clue that momentum is dying and then we're getting ready to reverse. So until that happens, either on the hourly or on the four-hour time frame, really the four hours should be where it is, then we're going to keep going up. <laughs> it's just... That's the way it goes. That's the trend. I don't see any reason for it not to. And I'm also curious with my 889 that I like to use. Yeah, I figured it'd be very bullish. It hasn't tested yet. 
Let me see, 240. Oh, it has first test. Interesting, okay. So we have our crossover here and our first test. And that means this is wave three of five. So yeah, I think that we should be doing this uh, Elliott wave. I use this 889 as a possible count for my uh, Elliott wave. And basically what that would mean is this is our wave one. Oops, right here. And I'm not gonna go into the full count or even about Elliott wave in detail right now. It does look like a good ABC zigzag. And then this is wave three to the upside, which then leads to a wave four correction before wave five, which could actually take us higher. It'd be interesting to see what happens. But again, if we go higher and we don't have more momentum, but less on that second peak, that's a negative divergence. And that'll be your signal that the markets are going to drop and you probably want to short the NASDAQ because that'll be the weakest of the markets and giving you the best opportunity on the short side. But you can't do that until this Dow, the balloon's got to pop. So without that popping, we're going to keep going up as of right now. So I'll jump over real quick to, let's see, Bitcoin. Let's see, I'll use this price. And get rid of that 889 for now. Go to weekly and work my way down. Obviously, I've been tracking it before. And this is what I'm saying. There's just nothing going on right now. We dead, we're dead at this area of demand right now. Oh, take care, week, uh, Nick. You have a good weekend too. So you can see we're just kind of hanging out. We've lost momentum. That's not the bullish momentum building. That's just a lack of bearish momentum. It's just kind of everybody's just saying, you know what, crypto, pff, I'll look at it later. I really don't care. And that's the problem. Unless you're scalping this, you're just not getting much out of it. You know, we need some more influx, uh, influx into this. I think the impetus for the new wave, because we've had waves before, as you see, big wave up, pull back, big wave up, pull back, big wave up, pull back. The next big wave up, I think, might be triggered by bank failures. If there's a big failure in the U.S. banking system like we had back in 2007, 2008, then money might start to flow into alternatives such as crypto. You know, and that's it's a great alternative as a currency. So, um, you know, it's purely supply and demand. You don't have that uh, manipulation like you do with the governments, like the U.S. government or the Japanese government in those currencies. So unless something like that happens, I just don't see crypto rising anywhere near the previous highs it's had before. There's just no reason for it. You know, people, uh, the so-called serious traders look back and they say, well, look what happened, all these things. You guys caused a bubble and it blew up on your face. Uh -huh, laughing at you. I didn't get involved. I'm not, I'm not buying into it. So until we can see that people are uh, deadly serious about it, not just Elon Musk throwing out a bunch of tweets, I don't think we're going to get much out of crypto, period. And it sucks because it's a great vehicle. There's also too many of them. There's over 20,000 coins out there. Obviously, Bitcoin is the granddaddy of them all, and Ethereum is very, very driving in the markets. There's a lot of good ones that have very good uses as well. So anyway, um, I'm just not seeing much out of this. And right now, maybe we get a little more of a rally out of this little flag that's forming. You know, you see the rally base, rally base. We might be able to rally more. We don't have any overhead supply till 23,000 on the daily. Down on the four-hour time frame. And we are above 60, so we are bullish right now. But just like we were looking at for the equities, see how we're not making that new high right now on the momentum? If we fail to make the high as we make a new high on the price of Bitcoin, that'll be a divergence and we'll fall again back to the 19,000 area, basically to this. We could retrace back down. Now, if we do break out and we have more momentum than the previous high here, that's, that's the key. That would be your run in 23,000. That'll be your opportunity. But unless that happens, nah, forget it. I don't know if I got a good entry spot here on the four hour, kind of already in a demand zone. We missed it. That would have been your entry. If you're looking to go long, I actually could include that too. You had rally base, rally demand came in, not below 40, so we're okay. And there's your momentum, but it's needed, it needs to get up there to break that zone. You got to have more momentum. So if it doesn't do it, not going to happen. Okay, so I had a request here for the Hang Seng on the indice side. 
There we are, Hang Seng Index from TBC. This is a C CFD that I'm looking at, so hopefully it's accurate. Uh, boy, that is a free fall, isn't it? Jeez, do we have demand anywhere? When's the last time this has been this low? Let's see. CFDs, for those of you who are Americans and don't understand what they are, they're called contra contracts for difference. They're a hybrid between stocks and options. And they can be good if they have what's called DMA or direct market access. Okay, you're probably shocked that America knows all this, but I spent a lot of time in Europe. Anyway, so they're tradable securities. They're, like I said, a hybrid between stocks and options. And if you get direct market access where your broker is getting the quotes directly from the markets rather than making up their own, then it's a legitimate brokerage. You can trade them pretty well. But unfortunately, there's a lot of scams out there. And they also get into what's called spread betting. Uh, speaking of the Hang Seng, there's no demand on the weekly chart until here. 15.525. Looks like we got weakness. This is not holding. We tried, I think, maybe to hold that area, but no, nah, it didn't even try. It's just in a free fall right now. So you can see, yeah, we've got room to go to the downside. There's actually a supply zone that formed here on the Hang Seng. 16906 to 18164 drop base drop supply. So even if we do try to rally a little bit and it doesn't look like it wants to, there's no sign that momentum letting up. You know, it's at 21. It could go to zero. You get pegged down there. I go down to the daily chart, see if anything's letting up. Maybe a little. We might slow down a little. Here's why. You see, we're trying to make a new low or did make a new low today. They're ahead of us in time. But we didn't do that new low with more momentum we did with less. So we are starting to slow down a little bit. We might get a retracement here, but that would be a new opportunity for selling off before it drops again. I think people Matt, you know, see that recovery as a selling opportunity till we hit the 12.525 area. Because there's really just nothing else to hold it up. I don't know if there's anything on this daily chart if I go back. Where are we going back to? 2009. So basically they were already reliving the 2008 crash ahead of us. And this was the daily demand here. I don't know if it held. Let's see. No, we haven't gotten there yet. So there's a daily demand here. This is the weekly demand. I'll change the color so I know it's higher time frame. This too is weekly. And that's what I see on the Hang Seng. Well, we might get a little retracement, uh, that, but that's all it is. It's a retracement of the move down. And that will likely lead to another round of selling to get us down to at least 13,746, if not 12,525, ultimately, before you can bounce. Okay. Devon Energy, DVN, you said they've got some earnings coming out on Tuesday. Yep, there it is. Earnings coming out. I had a long on this. And unfortunately, the SOB hit my stop before it went to the target. <laughs> so I was definitely bullish on Devon Energy. Um, this was one of my picks that I had in my the Wendell effect, by the way. If you watch my videos, I do put out a couple of stock ideas. My second target here is 8353. So this is a bullish stock that has more momentum than it had before. That's why it's reaching those targets. Also, one of the reasons why I picked it to go up was this. It's seasonally good too. So I look at seasonality of certain securities and in DVN at the time, I don't remember exactly when it was. Let me see, do 15 years. But you can see right here, well, actually today, this might not be a bad opportunity. Look at that. 28th of October to November 5th, historically, 73% of the time, it's gone up about 7%. That's an annualized average return of 2,200%. That's pretty good. <laughs> so this is a really bullish time of year, obviously, because they're waiting on the earnings to come out. And if the earnings are really good, then it's going to get the boost. But historically, they've had good earnings this quarter, apparently. And I say that because seasonally on the chart, it's jumped dramatically. It's one of the biggest gains in the shortest period of time for almost the entire year when you look at the seasonal chart of Devon Energy. So, you know, I can't suspect, I can't... Uh, predict exactly what the earnings will be but you know if they're anything like chevron or shell whatever it was shell just came out with record earnings i mean this this sector has been extremely bullish right the energy sector has been going crazy and i can show you that too actually 
So I imagine they're probably gonna have some pretty good earnings unless something weird happened specifically for that security. But you see, look at this. In the last 200 days, let's do last six months. Energy is up 30% that compared to the S&P. Just on loan without the S&P, it's still up 21%. It's the only bullish sector, energy, right? So with Devin, yeah, it looks like it's a good time to be in that. And even after the earnings, obviously, all the way to November 10th, it's still 73% winner, 6.59% to the upside. So it's not as good as that little quick move. You know, 22% return. Wow. So, you know, going back to the chart, what do you do with this? Well, there is a demand zone or a pullback if you get it right there. All right, you got rally, base, rally. Um, actually, it doesn't quite follow through, but you might have missed it if this was your zone too. I don't know if there's, you know, I hate buying stuff after it's already up, so I might have just missed out on it, but it does look like it's getting ready to run. Even this pullback, that's a very bullish candle today, isn't it? So when you get that much bullish activity, or if you follow through, it's likely to take off. Uh, that still is the best entry down here. Unfortunately, I just don't know if we're going to pull back that much. Maybe if earnings come out and a little bit of a shock, you got kind of rally base base rally right there. 7291, 7178, or 7118, excuse me. My first initial target would be the 8353 that I've already had on this. And you saw that was already drawn here. That was this was a bullish trade. Unfortunately, it just went through my uh stop loss before it went up. When did I put that out? It must have been beginning of October in one of my videos. So I have to look back. So yeah, you just got to figure out where's the best time to get in again. And unfortunately, it already did a pullback. So I'm not sure where it's going to let you in. I don't buy breakouts. Um, I, I also don't like buying in front of the earnings, which shows Wednesday morning. So it's probably what, Tuesday night? Yeah. So we might just wait for the earnings and then play something. You know, there's also probably high volatility on this right now where you can even sell some options on it. It'd be kind of nice. I say sell, even though a lot of people think buying the options is a good thing. Implied volatility is probably at a peak right now or near it. Let's see, implied volatility. I don't know what all these indicators are. Let's see, they have just under technicals. I have stuff on other, oh, let's see what this one is. It lets me see it. I don't have to download anything. Now nah, I have to open up a different platform to get the implied volatility, unfortunately. So anyway, yeah, now I gotta get rid of that somehow. Settings, no, what do I want? That's not what I want. Oh, well, I'll get rid of some, I'll just get rid of both is. Move indicators. There we go. I'll just bring the R side back later. So, yeah, this does look bullish. I just don't really have a good entry spot for it, unfortunately. It looks like we might have already passed the, the premium entry spots. But if you can find something, go for it because this does look like it should be bullish. But I might wait for after earnings and wait for a pullback after those earnings. You know, actually, let me see if I can open my toss real quick. I know I'm almost out of time here and I got a lot of things I'm doing today. But. I can show you implied volatility the way I look at it. And like I was saying, typically what happens with the earnings, and this goes for any earnings. Okay, actually, yeah. Actually, I'll do a paper money just in case. Um, anyway, I, I got so many things open on my computer. I don't want to get it lagging or something if I accidentally hit a buy or sell button. So uh, basically what happens is before earnings, uh, the, it, the implied volatility usually spikes. And then after earnings, everybody knows what the earnings are. So the implied volatility drops pretty quickly usually. So if you can sell options before that, then typically you'll see that um, that implied volatility will collapse and you'll make money on the vega of the option. So this is a five minute chart. We obviously want to look at a much bigger time frame here. I'll go to a daily and I'll bring in studies. My sets. Let's see. Add study. There it is. And supply volatility gauge. Yeah, it's already coming down a little bit, unfortunately. Let's zoom in a little more on this. Get rid of that white space to the right. 
Oops. Time axis. There we go. That's better. Anyway. That's what I wanted to see. See how the implied volatility was actually really, really high back here. It's already diving a little bit, which is unusual. Usually in front of earnings, but you can see that showing the earnings right here coming up. Generally, before the earnings come out, you'll get a jump in volatility. This one actually dies off a few days, almost a week before the earnings come out. It's unusual to see it drop that quickly. But you notice after the earnings come out, it still drops more. And that's what usually happens. Once the news is out, there it is, implied volatility dives down and it'll do it again. It should dive down into this third range because range one, two, three, four, five. So with implied volatility very, very high, typically you can actually sell an iron condor or you can sell an, a strangle if you're interested. Or even if you're gutsy, you could do a straddle and you sell that. And basically what happens is it doesn't matter which way the markets move, you're delta neutral, directional neutral, but when the volatility collapses, you profit from that. And you also profit from a couple of days of expiration too. Um, not expiration, a couple of days of decay, I should say. Uh, buying the 80 call? Oh, you bought a lottery ticket basically. Okay. Yeah, if you bought an 80 call, you're probably going to go in the money after the earnings perhaps because it should go run up towards that target I had. Uh, I call that a lottery ticket because when people buy those options deep out of the money, they cost very little. But the problem is, and I'll show you here, you've got very low delta, so the directional movement doesn't affect you as much. And therefore, it takes a gigantic move for you to make a good amount of money. So it depends on which one you said December. Okay, so you're probably talking about the monthlies. And I'm on a spread here. I got to change that. See, I do a lot of iron condors, as you can tell. <laughs> but yeah, if you got the 80s, it's going to be cheaper to buy than one that's in the money. And obviously, it would have been even cheaper back then. But see, actually, I can go to think back. Have some fun here. Depending on what day you bought it, you know, if we go in on a date, say you bought it a couple of weeks ago, I don't know exactly when you did, but. EVN, you don't need that graph. You go into, why does it not show me December options? I'll just use this November one anyway, it's fine. And any more strikes. There we go. So an 80 call being purchased on the 10th, you start walking this forward to where we are now. And you can see, it's only made 15 bucks and you spent initially for it about $250 roughly. So it's not returning much because what you really need is a gigantic move because the Delta on an option that far out, see, where do we have Delta? There we go. The Delta is only 30 cents, right? So you're not getting a whole lot out of that. It depends on where you bought it and when you bought it. I don't know what that is exactly, but we call those lottery tickets, especially if you do something like this, like 95 way out of the money. Oh, I can get that for 50 cents. Yeah, you can get it for 50 cents, but you're not going to make anything on it unless you get a gigantic move in the market, right? You can see if I go forward in time, the time value decaying is greater than the gain you're getting in the price. So that's where it gets a lot of people in trouble. Now, I, this one's not as much of a lottery ticket. It's not that far out of the money. It's 10 bucks out of the money. It's still pretty good, decent, a decent level. But as you can see, it's got a little profit because you got to make sure the Delta can overcome your time decay. And remember that Delta, that's for a full point move. And the Theta is just for one day. Plus you've also got Vega that's collapsing on you too. And that's working against you. So even if the market does move in your favor for that call, you can't, you got to be careful because once the, the um, volatility collapses, when the earnings are out, you'll lose a lot of money on that because you know the volatility can drop. Let's see what, oh, I had the wrong page. What percentage are we looking at here? If I go back to charts. I mean, you see, depending on when you purchase this, if you purchase this back here, when you were at 60, now it's almost 70%, it's down to 53% volatility. This is likely to drop in the 40s, you know, right around 46, you're talking about another seven points of volatility drop. And it's the Vega something like that nine cents yeah i mean the delta is still okay that you can might be able to overcome both the theta and the vega right 
Does this show the Vega on here? I don't have the Vega. Why not? Let's see, add Vega. I'm just going to add it. There we go. So again, the Vega, look at that, $7.90 for every one point, plus the theta of negative 670 is working against you. Both of those together, you know, about 14 bucks is coming out for every $1 you move up. So it, it's, and it may not move up $1 every day. I don't know what the average true range of, of dev and energy is. And when it comes out of the earnings, even there, it doesn't move a lot. You know, the last earnings, 155. I don't know if that was a surprise or not. I'm sorry, that's dividends. There's the earnings. That one actually moved down about $8, okay? So let's imagine if we if you're good and we get an $8 move to the upside, right? We're at $76 right now. And if we move up by eight bucks, 36, 65 times eight, you'll gain $293 on the Delta, right? But if the volatility drops, like I was saying, by um, uh, what was it? You know, eight points, seven point, oops. 1592 is coming up. No, that's not right. Uh, plus eight. Sixty-three bo bucks is coming off that profit plus the theta. You know, you still gotta wait until Tuesday. So you got Friday's coming off, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, another five days of theta so that's another like 30 bucks that's 90 dollars coming off that 200 plus dollars profit so you might still profit but not nearly as much as you expected it to and the rate of return would be much less than if you just bought a closer to at the money option because the there again the closer you get to at the money we go down to that 70 oh, i'm sorry 70 bucks i did that wrong i did a 76 why did i do that uh, it's okay. The numbers were right. But yeah, if you were to do an at the money option, you're going to have a bigger delta that's going to really overcome that theta and the vega. I know they're more expensive as options, but in the long run, you get a better rate of return by doing that. So you got to be careful with the kind of options that you trade, especially when you're trying to get in, you know, especially before earnings, you're, you're thinking, oh, it's going to be a big move. And you know, there's always a possibility it misses and it goes down. Then you're really in trouble because again, that delta is working against you, but so is that theta and the vega. So just be careful with those kind of options. Anyway, that's all the time I got for this week. Hopefully you enjoy this. If you did, uh, let me know. If you didn't, yeah, you can let me know what I can do better next time too. I'm always open for uh, suggestions. So I want to thank everybody for being here and I will talk to you again soon. Until next time, trade safe, trade well. Everybody take care.